Welcome to the Newcomer Podcast. I'm Eric Newcomer. I had an awesome conversation with Bajal Sumaya at Lightspeed Venture Partners. Talked about two huge topics in the world of venture capital. India, Bajal spent many years investing for Lightspeed in India and sort of the ups and downs of the venture market. And then in the latter half of our conversation, we looked at how venture capital is becoming more like the private equity business, what happens to venture capital in a world of rising interest rates, and how does he think about the future of a venture capital firm that has more than $7 billion in funds raised to invest. It's a great conversation deep in the world of venture capital. Give it a listen. Bajel, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Eric. It's great to be on. There's a lot here. You've sort of taken the journey with light speed and growing up with what's become a huge firm. I thought part of the episode, we just get to sort of look at what's going on outside the US, especially since you spent a bunch of time in India, spent some time thinking about Europe and then get to the US, but sort of trying to make sense of the global venture landscape. How did you get to Lightspeed India or get us to that moment in time sort of working with Lightspeed India? Yeah. And just before I do, you know, something felt jarring to me, which was that, you know, this idea of a huge firm. And the reason it felt jarring to me is because we don't think of ourselves that way. And I don't think we ever want to show up in the market in right. that way. I think there's such an art to our business and there's such a sort of relationship aspect to the business and a sense of just a very high degree of personalization and often being large can conflict with that. And that's yeah. actually, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about later. What's the total fund size? So our last set of funds that we raised early last year, Eric, were just under seven billion. Yeah. Across early and growth vehicles that we've raised over time and the growth vehicles are global vehicles. You know, but it's just sort of more one of the things we think about a lot, right, is how we continue to operate in a very nimble, agile right. way. Right. And that while well, having what is objectively a huge amount of money. Yes. For the I, yes. World. That's yes. fair. That's fair. But anyway, we'll come to that. I guess. No, but I know. I, I get yeah, it. Yeah. You know, so look, my journey has been really, you know, as an entrepreneur and operator, you know, and an investor across sort of different parts of my career in the US and in India. I was in the US until I moved to India to start up Lightspeed's business in 2008. And out of business school, you know, was a participant in the dot com craziness as an early member of a startup during that time. And I think I still sort of have that, you know, etched into my memory. What was the startup? It's a company called edu.com that was creating a sort of a protected channel for brands to sell to students at differential pricing. And so integrated with colleges to create a protected channel where brands could- And that was you know, in the Bay Area? That was actually on the East Coast. Oh, okay. But during .com? Yeah, yeah. And I was an early member of the team there. And that company was acquired, you know, really in an asset sale in early 2001 by a then public company called Student Advantage. And that's where I met the General Catalyst team because they mm. were one of the, you know, early investors in that business. And after I served out my six months of the transition, Joel over at General Catalyst, who I think understands entrepreneurs very well, called me and said, hey, you must be pretty fed up of doing that. Why don't you come over and join us? And this is just when General Catalyst was getting going. Mm you know, as an institutional fund. And yeah, I loved it because it was my first exposure to venture, but in a very entrepreneurial environment. And that continues again to shape a lot of, you know, how I practice the business today and how we think about the business. And then in 2003, I just was so envious of all of these incredibly passionate founders building things. And I stepped out and I started a company focused on local search and context specific search. Mm -hmm. This was before it was you know, it was as widely known as it is today. And the idea being that, gosh, there's all of this information out there, but yet I just bought a home and I was rifling through the yellow pages and calling service providers who had bought the biggest ads. This is crazy. You know, th this cannot possibly be how I'm going to make a decision. And so that kind of led me to think about how do we bring technology to really understand the information that's out there in a context specific way. And started that company with actually the former CTO of edu.com, mm -hmm. you know, who I'd gotten to know. And then subsequently, someone that's become a dear friend of mine, Brad Gerstner at Altimeter. Huh. And, you know, Brad and I had crossed paths originally. He Catalyst. was an investor or a co-founder? No. So he joined as a co-founder. And huh. yeah. And, you know, we first met, yeah, when he was running 
National Leisure Group, which was a General Catalyst funded business. Mm. And so, you know, we got going and eventually we didn't raise any outside capital, but ended up selling the business to a public company called Marchex at the time. And and that was kind of really when I thought about my life and career in a slightly different way. And and I was really drawn to what was happening in India. You know, the country was going through a very significant period of economic growth, a lot of innovation happening. And I moved out there and actually for the first few years, I was running a you know, what would typically be described as a more traditional growth equity business, you know, mm. a manufacturing business that, you know, here would be a GDP growth business, but there was growing at about 30, 35% a year, but was very myopic, very inward facing. And I thought there was so much more that we could do with that business. And it was a wonderful way to learn that country and that market and actually learn a lot about how applying a US lens or a developed market lens is not only the wrong answer, but can actually, you know, be problematic. Hmm. And that was really valuable and ultimately sort of brought that to bear in, in what we ended up building at Lightspeed. How long were you investing in India and how much was deployed? So look, I, you know, t today, Eric, we have, now we think of the region as India, Southeast Asia, because there's actually right. a lot of talent movement between those regions, founder movement. And companies from India, when they're thinking about getting out of India, often Southeast Asia is the next frontier. So I think about that region. You know, we have today 19 investment professionals in the region, and then an operating team or a platform team that supports our portfolio of about 10. So quite sizable across four offices, Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, and Singapore. And, you know, since we started investing in India, we've invested approximately one and a half billion dollars in the market. Hmm. So it's, you know, it's meaningful, but kind of always, I think, timed to how the market was developing. So actually up until 2015, we continued to invest out of our global funds at a very measured pace. And, you know, again, many of our peers had raised dedicated fund vehicles and there were a set of local homegrown funds as well. You know, we knew this was a market we wanted to be in, but we didn't think it warranted a dedicated strategy up until sort of I'd say in. 13, 14, we began to see changes on the ground, hmm. founder quality, more risk capital, and sort of really now the beginning of significant internet adoption, right? Which is really the trend line that okay. we're investing behind. And so in 2015, we raised our first dedicated early stage fund for the market, but it was still a very, I think, a very disciplined size at 135 million. You know, fund two was 175, fund three was 275. And the idea was really to keep the bar high, hmm. you know, to focus on the highest impact opportunities, you know, and then over time, as we've raised our growth funds, if we do miss things at early, which obviously we do, then we do have the ability now to hopefully still be able to partner with those entrepreneurs later in their journey. What were the key companies or like what successful investments did you see? So early on, an early investment in a company called Tudor Vista, which was essentially one of the first companies that was connecting in that case, tutors in that market with students globally. So a very early incarceration of ed tech. That company was acquired in a trade sale by Pearson, but was one of the early exits in the market. And then an investment that I led in 2010 in a company called the Indian Energy Exchange, which was building an electronic market for power. You know, and this is an example actually of where, you know, when we talked about it in the partnership and the natural thing to do is to seek analogs. Where else has this been built? And the answer was nowhere. And then it can be very well, if there's no examples of success, we shouldn't do it. Right. It obviously can't be successful. But we sort of got into being very first principles about what's happening in the power market in India. And why does something like this need to exist? And I won't bore you with the details, but there was a set of reasons why something like this needed to exist. And it was a classic example of how we could think about getting venture type exposure to a sector like energy or power right, that was going through a massive investment cycle. And so we co-led the company's Series A, and actually the only round of external capital that they ended up raising in late 20. And, and that company, we took public in 2017 and the local stock exchange, and then over time fully exited over the subsequent few years. So that was one of our sort of early investments. And it helps, right, when you go to a new market to, to know that you can, you know, invest, but also take money out and get a company public and see the full life cycle. Is the strategy generally like looking for companies that can be global players or do you invest in 
startups that could just sort of dominate the Indian tech market? And would that yeah. be sort of large enough? It's all of the above, right? Typically on the consumer side and on some, you know, B2B, I wouldn't say B2B software. I don't think the Indian market for software is large enough to support a high impact company. But those, so those companies tend to get outside India. For example, we have a company called Innovacer, which is focused on the healthcare segment in software that got outside India very early or Darwin Box and HR SaaS, you know, that, you know, built in India now has gone to Southeast Asia. But in, I would say in consumer, that tends to be almost exclusively focused on the domestic economy. Mm. And, you know, B2B networks or B2B commerce, you know, will typically be focused or B2B fintech, you know, on the local economy. What we're now seeing more recently as the founder universe has sort of become more confident, I think bolder, building better products, is we're seeing more of them today start off with a, we want to build for the world kind of, you know, mindset, which is really energizing. And one area that we're specifically seeing a lot of that and have invested behind is are sort of B2B marketplaces that are connecting supply in India and other markets with demand globally, you know, primarily starting out with the US. And the idea being that you have, you know, with the disruption from COVID of supply chains, right? And then the geopolitical issues with China, there's a very strong movement towards China plus one sourcing, hmm. right? And a lot of the supply base is actually in the Southeast Asia region and in India region, India, Vietnam, Thailand, so on. And so how do you now connect that supply, right, with buyers anywhere in the world? And so we're beginning to see ideas like that emerge and investing actively behind that. And again, it's one of the reasons that we're so excited about continuing to build a global firm because we see ideas like this. I feel like a lot of the like India story that trickles back to Silicon Valley has been, you know, the flip cart wars and like yeah. Amazon diving in and all the investment around that space. What was the impact of that enthusiasm on sort of the Indian like startup ecosystem and how did you guys sort of navigate that? Yeah. You know, I think the first, I mean, this is sort of a, an observation now with hindsight across various different markets is the first generation of companies often tends to be copycats, right? For better or for worse. And that's okay. You know, we saw in India, it would be the online travel agents in e-commerce, Flipkart, Amazon, ride sharing and online booking for shows and movies and so on. There were the deal a day businesses at one point until folks realized that right. India is a different market. That doesn't work there, right? And it's really interesting because I think investors are equally culpable, right? Investors will, oh, that's an idea that's working in market X, right. so I will invest in market Y, except market Y may not support that particular idea. And then if founders sense that investors want to invest there, well, guess what? <laughs> they'll start a company and they'll go raise money. And so that's invariably the first set of companies. And then we started to see, and IEX was an example, another company that we've invested in and you know, very early and has grown to significant scale is a company called Oyo, which is a virtual hospitality network. You start seeing founders build companies with a lot more nuance and understanding of how those models need to be adapted for the local market. And I would actually go so far as to say that in most businesses where there is sort of a real world component or linkage, including e-commerce or ride sharing, the Indian startups have competed very strongly with what are the best companies out of the US. So whether it is Flipkart and Amazon or Ola and Uber or Make My Trip and Expedia, the or Nokri, which is the job site and early on Monster, Actually, what you see is that the Indian companies are winning or are certainly very strong competitors on the food side, Swiggy and Zomato, right? And so I think that's been very energizing for the startup ecosystem where the products tend to be more fully virtual and catering to, let's say, the 80 to 100 million English speaking population, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. There, it will typically be and is the global products that dominate because there isn't this real world nuance and component. Although once you get beyond that English speaking population, again, there's probably a need and you know we're investors in a company called ShareChat, which is a social network for actually none of the English speaking audience. 
you know, and so I, I think then what you start seeing is these businesses that are being built actually that are very unique to the market. And that's really exciting to us because mm. those businesses will typically also have higher defensibility and stronger capital efficiency. And so today, what is the level of enthusiasm for like India with the firm? So you, just for context for listener, we can get into this, you know, you come back eventually to the U.S. to sort of focus on the firm and investments here, but yeah. you're still very involved in sort of the strategy. Absolutely. Yeah. So what is the sort of approach at the moment or what's your sense of the market and how much capital you're putting yeah. behind it? I think this is true about technology investing in general, which is the long arc is really a one-way street, right? This is something that I was chatting with one of my colleagues about earlier. In 2000, the digital economy in the US represented about 6% share of GDP. You know, today that's at 10.2% and obviously absolute GDP has grown. This is in the US, right? So mm. there's just significant growth and it will be no different in the other markets that we invest behind. And so, you know, in India, when we think about just overall GDP growth, population growth, but adoption of the internet and digital technologies, it is a one-way street. And so kind of over the right horizon, you know, I think that our level of excitement remains very high, although not rose-colored for lots of <laughs> reasons that we can talk about, right. right? And it sort of reflects why we've paced the way that we have. That said, you know, I think anytime you over-index on a point in time, and that could have been 2022 or 2021 in technology, you know, or 2022 in global technology, you know, or a point in time like, you know, 22, 23 in India, you know, clearly activity is lower. I would argue that's really healthy. You know, 2021, we know was out of control everywhere, right. but in shallow markets, Eric, out of control is even more damaging. Hmm right? Because the asset price inflation is even more significant in shallow markets, right? And sort of the movements are more jarring. And so I think it's healthy, it's necessary, it's painful. But again, if I draw from my experience in the dot-com boom, you know, in the US and then the subsequent, you know, bust in 2001, I remember looking at these numbers. So the peak of US venture capital in 2000 was about 180 billion. Hmm. In 2002, that number was 20 billion. Brutal. Brutal, right? <laughs> and I remember it because it was like, oh my gosh. I mean, this is when I was at GC kind of early and it's like, do we need to exist? Right. <laughs> you know, it just wasn't clear what was investable and what was going to come next. And, you know, and what we know today is during those periods of capital scarcity, you know, true innovation happened and true builders were still drawn to solving problems using technology. But in that moment in time, I remember it was entirely possible to think that nothing was happening, right? And so again, I tend to sort of want to be able to see what's happening today clearly so that I can be, and we can be intellectually honest, but I think equally importantly to be able to pull up and say, okay, what is the trend line here? You know, what's happening? Where is that going? And to consistently question whether there's a challenge to that thesis, whether it's technology more broadly or the development of India's digital economy and Southeast Asia's digital economy. Do you have a dedicated amount of capital? On the early stage side, we just raised Lightspeed India 4 that we started investing out of early this year, which is a $500 million vehicle. And that reflects our view of how the opportunity has continued to grow, but we still want to be measured. Right. And then on, on the growth side, there's no allocation. You know, we tend to focus on the best opportunities. And so, yeah, if you think about the dedicated pool, it's that 500 million. You're probably more of a scholar of this than I am. But, you know, U.S. venture has sort of a history of diving into regions and then sort of pulling back with, you know, yeah. like Europe, like Benchmark, I think, used to have a presence in Europe. And, you know, they're all sort of you know, in and out, like China, India have sort of been hot and then not. Yeah. And I totally hear what you're saying about over time, like technology continues to eat more markets, but then you, you need like, or at least the traditional venture ecosystem depends on follow on rounds and other yeah. firms playing. And, you know, I, obviously you and me, but to put it out for the listener, like at this moment in time, you know, Sequoia has just sort of spun off its China and India fund, sort of moving away from a global firm, like focusing on those regions. Yes. Yeah. So I guess where are we in this sort of 
venture mood in India right now? Or do you see sort of other investors sort of as dedicated at this moment? Yeah, I can't comment on Sequoia and, and I'm not privy to, you know, sort of the thinking behind their decisions, but I can sort of comment on how we think about this. It's really hard to build a global firm, you know, and it's really hard to attract the right kind of talent to inculcate, again, that shared vocabulary and sense of, of mission and values and culture and do you see what I see and trust, which is so foundational to our business. It's difficult. And I think that's one of the main reasons I would suspect that firms that have gone internationally, you know, may subsequently have sort of retrenched. And anytime something is is really difficult, really hard, naturally, the right question to ask yourself, is it worth it? Right. You know, and I think that's a very personal question in many cases. It's personal at the individual level, right? Because for a firm to go to another market does require, you know, someone that has political capital within the firm at that point in time to put their hand up and say, I'm going to invest my time and energy you know, to do this, right? And so that individual will ask them whether it's worth it, will ask themselves whether it's worth it. The firm will ask themselves whether it's worth it. And, you know, an argument can be made, well, if within a 30-minute drive from Sandy Hill Road, as was the case not so long ago, if I can, you know, find a set of companies that are great, why do I need to go beyond that, right? And I would argue then that that thinking would apply to why go to New York, why go to LA, right? right? Why go to Europe? Why go to LATAM? I mean, why go beyond 30 minutes of Sandhill Road? And that's what venture used to be. Why go to Boston, right? And there was this long period where, you know, it was like totally cool to just say like, we love San Francisco, Silicon Valley, like startups and everything else is sort of like a distraction. And that was something you would hear pretty regularly. I think the pandemic blew a lot of that up. You know, all of a sudden people were excited about Europe. It was easier to do deals abroad. I mean, obviously there've been other moments where people were, but I think the pandemic in particular was like, there was a brief period where it was like, everything's global. Everybody can invest everywhere. Like there's an arbitrage, like people started, you know, sending partners out to Europe. And now like, I mean, some of the, you know, hop in is sort of more challenge. UiPath yeah. didn't sustain. Like some of the actual companies that were fueling the narrative didn't sort of live up. And then at the same time, now we're seeing that so much of venture is in AI and AI is really centralized, you know, in, in Silicon Valley yeah. and San Francisco. I don't, yeah. So what do you make of sort of the return to sort of, Silicon Valley exceptionalism in in sort of the venture world at the moment. Yeah. I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer, right? I think different firms, different people, different personalities, different strategies, different ambitions, different levels of hunger and kind of fire to go build something. Remember, again, part of what you need to even consider in a sense, you know, going and doing something and building something larger and expanding the canvas is the same way with a founder, right? There'll be founders who will build a company that they want to own 100% of, and they're fine if that company grows 15% a year and throws off a certain amount of cash. And then there are some founders who want to change the world. And we're not judging, you know, one is better than the other. We know that for venture capital, one is more the type that we would back than the other. And so I think it's the same in venture, which is it's a function of what the firm's and the individual's aspiration is. Right. And if you don't have people that are willing to say, geez, I have a burning desire to go do this because I see this opportunity. Well, then, you know, that will be as big a part of the discussion as where AI is or where the opportunity is. You know, what I would tell you is a way we think about at Lightspeed is what are we optimizing for? Right. Because we've got to have that clarity and that then drives our decisions. So there's three things we want to see access and compete for the very best opportunities wherever they are. Hmm. Because to generate the best returns, we think we need to be in the best companies. And if a significant proportion of those companies are now outside the US or outside Silicon Valley, then we need to be able to see them in order to perform, right? Again, now part of this is also a choice about scale. Sure, if you raise $200 million, you don't need to. But it's also because of learning. I mean, a lot of what we bring to our companies is because of the journeys that we've been on. 
you know, and the different models that we've seen and how our conceptual models get challenged because you've seen something somewhere else. I would argue that actually, you know, markets like India where there's UPI and LATAM where there's PICS are a little bit, you know, showing us what the future of fintech could be, hmm. you know, with these very low cost or zero cost payment rails, right? I think, you know, we saw virtual goods models and kind of, you know, monetization models that came out of China, right? That innovated around kind of how social media companies could monetize and generate revenue. So for the learning and the experience, we think that's important. So we want to see access and compete for the very best opportunities wherever they are. The second thing is we want to serve founders and companies in the most impactful way, right? In a way that moves the needle for them. So that's sort of another design principle. And the third is that we want to attract the best talent to Lightspeed and enable them to do their best work. Those are the three things we want to do. Now, for any other firm, those things may be different, and that's okay. But this is what we're building towards. And then the question becomes, you know, well, do you get distracted, right? And I think, in my mind, anytime I'm presented with this idea of a trade-off, you can either do X or Y. The first thing, at least, I want to do is I want to challenge that trade-off. I don't want to just accept it. Right? Because then we go deeper in understanding why there is a trade-off. Is there a trade-off? You know, we say to companies, well, either you grow fast or you have compelling unit economics. Really? Is right. that really the choice? Right. You know, to build value, you have to do both. And the best companies will figure out a way to do both. And some will not. And so for us, I think it is, you know, it is, well, how do we our enterprise team is, we think, one of the best in the business. Well, they are deeply focused on enterprise, right? They're not getting distracted by necessarily what the India team is doing. Right. But then organizationally, how do you create points of intersection so that we're exchanging ideas, right, and experiences? So to me, that comes to firm design and being very mindful of the risks. And obviously, we're still building this, but... You know, How many people is it right now? Globally? Yeah. Total headcount will be north of 200. And I think we have about 70 investors, you know, globally. Yeah. Across the US, Israel, Europe, India, Southeast Asia, you know, and the China is an affiliate. So in a sense, separate business. And so that would be the size. And we've been at it since I think Israel was our first international market in the early 2000s. So this isn't a new thing for us. It's not something we've done quickly. You know, we've not tried to do things overnight. Are you still gung ho about the China affiliate? I mean, the tensions there have, you know, become more complicated. Yeah, certainly. And we have to be, you know, mindful of that. I think, you know, it is a, in a sense, a benefit that is an independent entity. And I think sort of their investment strategy primarily centers right now around sustainability, climate, and the EV ecosystem. And so there's some learning there, but, you know, I would say that it's a good relationship that we have and, you know, we are very sensitive to kind of everything that's happening globally. And, you know, that'll be something that we continue to think about what the right answer is. But, you know, as of now, it is run separately, but, you know, they're friends of ours, just like, you know, any other firm would be, and you can collaborate and share notes, you know, and learnings about things. But, you know, in, in essence, it is a separate business. Just before I totally move off India and start talking about like yeah. firm construction and all that, what do you think are the most promising areas in terms of India and like startup investments right now? Or where are you guys deploying sort of the most money or what's sort of the yeah. promise? So, you know, one area that I, I mentioned earlier is a lot of these cross-border businesses beyond software. So cross-border marketplaces, cross-border payments and in payment infrastructure. Hmm. And so if... If five years ago, if we talked about what businesses were getting outside of India, those were primarily SaaS companies. You know, today I would say there's a lot more in these other categories. And I think that's a very compelling theme. The other is we're beginning to see a fair amount of activity around the EV ecosystem there. And we've made an initial set of investments. Like manufacturers or? No, again, we'll think about a little bit like our India Energy Exchange, you know, kind of lens, which is, gosh, there's this very compelling trend line, but, you know, the bulk of it is not really a venture play, right? right? But how do we think about getting venture-like exposure? 
And so, for example, we've invested in a company called Exponent Energy, which is building fast charging batteries and intellectual property, and then a fast charging network in a sense that's tied to their batteries. And so think about Intel inside, you know, the Exponent battery is now being adopted by OEMs, you know, so that their customers don't have to think this is primarily in commercial applications where downtime can be very expensive. And so, you know, OEMs are adopting their batteries with an exponent battery inside, makes it more marketable. You know, those batteries then work at the exponent franchised fast charging network. So that's an example. It's really an IP business, you know, with then the, you know, the network being franchised. So that would be an example of a venture play on that sector. We are looking at financial technology in particular in Southeast Asia. We've invested fairly actively in India there as well, but you know, there's a lot to be built in Southeast Asia. And that's an example of, you know, kind of global themes, right? The CFO suite or, you know, these financial products for small businesses, right? With different insertion points, it could be a credit insertion point or a banking insertion point. That's an area that we've invested across geographies in the US and Europe and India and in Southeast Asia. And wealth management, digital wealth management is an area that we're looking at too. What do you think is sort of the biggest strength of the Indian market right now and the opportunity and the biggest sort of like blocker or like barrier to making sort of investments at the moment? Uh, it's a really interesting question. I think the biggest strength is the raw material for our business, which is the founders. Hmm. You know, it's really interesting. When we started investing in India, I would have characterized the typical Indian founder as a somewhat defensive risk averse, control oriented founder archetype, mm. right? Which is not great for venture capital. And I would characterize today, you know, the founder archetype as no different than what we would talk about here, which is, you know, wanting to change the world really can lean into, not everyone, but leans into risk. And they've sort of seen this first wave of venture scale companies get built, right? And so there's a repeat flywheel and founders really are, and talent is the raw material of our business, right? And so, you know, for me, that's the most exciting change and sort of the, if you will, the superpower of the market. And I will say the work ethic, I mean, you've got to realize that many of these folks or almost all of these folks are from Indian middle-class families. Now, mm -hmm. when I say Indian middle-class, I do not mean U.S. middle-class, yes. right? I mean, you know, families with income levels of of $3,000 to $15,000. Like they're from those families. Yeah. Insanely driven. You know, and what they've had to accomplish to get to this point, you know, is itself evidence of really what's under the hood. And the work ethic, you know, the intensity, the hunger, it sort of, you know, it gives me whatever, you know, shivers up my spine because there is this sense of this is their moment. Right. And then obviously the rapid digitization of this country and the government's commitment to that, you know, rides along with the development of talent. You know, what are maybe some of the biggest challenges? I think it is the time it takes to build these companies mm. and the just the challenges in the economics. And, and these are related. So here's a really interesting thing, which is because GDP per capita is so much lower in a market like India than in the West. To build a billion dollar revenue or scale company in India means that operationally you are building an eight to ten billion dollar scale company in the US, right? Because in the, terms of like people you touch, it, customer, right, whatever. In, in terms of the volume of transactions, right, the right. number of people you acquire, touch, the number of shipments, the supply chain scale. Just think about that, right? So the complexity of that you know, it's really high. And what it means is it will take longer and we can't force it beyond a certain point. Capital, forcing capital into these companies is not necessarily the answer. And I think we've learned that time and again. So that's one. And then because, you know, typically GDP per capita is lower, that translates into a smaller absolute profit pool, right? And so, you know, in terms of the unit economics, it can be tough. And so profitability actually takes longer for many of these companies, especially if you're trying to scale and build leadership. So I think those are important challenges that we have to be mindful of as we're company building. And then as it relates to investing, 
look, liquidity, this is not a market that is as developed as the US or China. And so, you know, we've been very mindful of this. We've distributed, you know, uh, over a billion dollars of liquidity from the market, you know, but it's tough to come by. You have to be very switched on to it. And so I, I'd say as a venture investor, you know, that's another challenge that we think a lot about. As a global firm, how much do you force sort of consistent multiples or, like, you know, it, you're just sort of saying the challenge. Like if you looked at sort of users, you might think one thing. And if you tried to model out, you know, profitability or whatever, you would come to a different assessment. But how much is there an effort to say, oh, we want not think about like, oh, what the sort of game on the field is in any particular market. We want to think about what a company is worth on some global metric, or do you end up having to look at it region by region? So substitute region for sector, Eric. Okay. Right. Would we apply consistent multiples to AI companies, mature enterprise software spaces, right. e-commerce, social media? Right. The answer is no. You can make some argument that on a fundamental level, like their ability to eventually produce cash flow, they should root out. But I understand sort of in the early stage that becomes like very difficult. And so you have to. Yeah. It's yeah. sort of, I think it, the, there always is nuance. Now, should we be aware of that? Yes. If we see a significant difference in multiple, should we question why? Yes. Should we understand why? Yes. You know, should we apply our own judgment? Absolutely. Right. But, you know, one of the things you'll notice is that scaled companies that become market leaders and have high quality teams with strong governance in India trade at significant premiums hmm. to their peers almost anywhere in the world. Interesting. All right. Now, early on, we as a global firm, we just couldn't reconcile that. We're like, no, it seems too expensive, seems too expensive. Well, right. 15 years in, it hasn't changed. <laughs> okay. Right. So then you sort of say, why? Well, there's several reasons. One is that those companies are so difficult to replicate hmm. because of the friction required to build them and the time that it takes, right? That there's a certain kind of gravity that those businesses have. Hmm. And there's a scarcity of those kinds of businesses, right? And so now when you think about capital allocators in the world that want to have exposure to those kinds of companies, there's a limited set, right? And so this is what I mean by we don't just want to accept it. And we'll never just say, well, it's sort of like in 2021, when we were investing, we weren't assuming 2021 multiples on exit. Right. You're still questioning it. You're saying, what are normalized multiples? And okay, well, let's be eyes wide open that we may be overpaying on the way in, but right. let's not think this is normal. Right. Right. Part of what you're saying is the multiples that are rational to pay to win the deal and the multiples that you're sort of giving it to assess sort of the payoff in the long term and you sort of need both. That's right. And as a result, there is a lot of companies that we will pass on because ultimately it doesn't make sense, you know, based on the entry multiple. But my point was more that, yeah, I think each market, each sector, you know, has its own dynamics, hmm. right? Life sciences, different. Fintech, different. You know, enterprise software, different. And the same for geographies. And it's actually that thinking for us, Eric, that every time sort of these questions, it's often like we think of geos as these, you can think of, oh, geez, there's very different things. But literally, if you, if you start substituting sector for geo, right? Because as venture firms, we've had to reinvent ourselves. We've had to go to new sectors. We've right. had to understand new opportunities. And often they look different and we've got to challenge ourselves and adapt our mental models and then either embrace or reject. That's yeah. okay. But we can't say, well, it's different. So let's not, you know, at least that's how yeah. we think about it. What motivated you to come back to the U.S. and what is sort of your focus at the moment? Lightspeed is a special place and the ability to play a bigger role at the firm is really exciting. I mean, you know, I think we're all very lucky to be doing what we do, you know, but to have the opportunity to kind of continue to help build on the growth of the firm, you know, the platform that is built so far by the founders and the team, that's hugely energizing. And as you're probably hearing, I think there's a lot of kind of learnings and observations from, you know, my journey and our firm's journey outside of the US that 
are abstracted away from India or a geography. They're really just about learnings having invested, right. you know, and to think about how do we now bring some of those learnings to the firm and along with the learnings of everyone else here and to now build the next phase, you know, in a sense of the firm and the firm has grown a lot, incredible talent. And so, yeah, just the opportunity to, to do more. How much time are you sort of internally focused versus trying to do deals? Yeah, I mean, if sort of internally focused is, I'll exclude from that, let's say kind of, you know, serving on investment committees, sure. right? Where obviously that's part of the investment business. I'd probably say it's, you know, it's 25 to 30%. So it's still mostly doing the deals. Yeah, yeah. you know, serving on deal teams and partnering with other investors and but it's, yeah, I'd say it's still predominantly, you know, we are in the investment business and it predominantly is still investing. But, you know, 25 to 30% really on thinking about our business, our firm, our strategy, our people, our systems, you know, and what it takes to operate a firm of this scale. Well, we've got to be more deliberate about it. It won't just happen. Right. So, you know, I think there's been this question percolating now for a couple of years, which is like, is venture capital going to follow some of the lessons of like private equity? You know, it's going to become a more sort of grown up asset class. Like maybe a venture capital firm will like go public someday. They will get much larger. You know, there are a lot, you know, you could organize differently. There, you know, the way the firms sort of survive generational transition could change. Like, what do you think is sort of appropriate to take from private equity? And what do you think? you know, venture capital is just like so different. It's not the right comparison. One of the things that I'm thinking about, so, so one is that, look, you know, what you just said has happened, right? So just look at the data, which is 2022 venture capital AUM was roughly two thirds of total global private market AUM a decade ago. Hmm. Just think about that. Just venture capital AUM in 2022, right? Hmm. And by total global private market AUM infrastructure, growth, all of that stuff, equity and credit, right? So that's happened. I don't think, you know, I like, why are we debating it? It's happened. Now, will it shrink 80%? We should debate that. <laughs> right. We don't think it will, but that happened 2000 to 2002, right? So there's precedent for that. Right. I think technology, and this is the second point I'd make, though technology in terms of its importance and emergence as a sector, if you will, in the mainstream economy has changed relative to 2000. And that was the sort of share of GDP I mentioned. It's not this little cottage industry anymore, right? right? And so then this brings me to something we talk about here. Is venture capital the right way to think about our business, hmm. right? So- when our business started, venture capital was synonymous with technology investing. Right. Because that was the innovation economy. There was very small number of these companies. You know, the balance sheets are all intellectual property and people. So they couldn't raise capital from anywhere else. And right. so this type of capital called venture capital or risk capital emerged to serve that part of the economy. Right. But today, that part of the economy is changed radically. And so then we think about, well, if we're serving our customers, which are technology companies, should that not be the lens through which we think about our business? And what is the business the same way we would want our founders to be thinking about how their industries are changing, how their customers are changing, and how they can keep serving those customers better than anyone else can? How can we keep serving our founders and our customers better than anyone else can. And I think that if you just assume that it's only venture capital, well, that's a fine business, right? But I don't know, this is sort of just, yeah. No, this is this is a bit more a technology investor than sort of venture capital. Or like, I mean, we saw, you know, General Catalyst, your old firm, is trying to figure out a third of their own type of debt for a fund. Right. I mean, I think there's a lot of talk of, you know, bigger firms going out and raising and saying, we don't need to invest to, you know, a seed fund level returns. We need to prove that we can consistently outperform, you know, the stock market. And if we can do that, 
it'll make sense for large investors to come to us if we're doing a sort of big enough fund size. Is that the way you think about it? Or what do you mean by saying not venture capital? It's about different types of investments and different return yeah. profiles. No, so I want to be clear. This is not about, well, let's just scale to scale. Yeah. It's working back from what are the needs of the companies and founders that we serve and recognizing that the core for Lightspeed still is an early entry point, Yeah. right? So, so we invest early. Even two thirds of our capital, of the growth capital that we've raised historically has gone into companies that we were earlier investors in, yeah. right? And so that is, it's back to that serves those companies and those founders, right? Yep. And then a third is, gosh, you know, unfortunately we do miss, you know, companies early, but if we can catch them at the series B or the series C, there's still, you know, the prizes have gotten bigger than they used to be. And we still, you know, want to be a part of those journeys. So it really is just coming back to none of this means moving away from early. I would argue, in fact, in our last fund cycle, Eric, we doubled our commitment to seed through B, hmm. right? And we've increased our early stage investment team and we're doing more there because we think the opportunity has grown. But it's just to say, well, over time, what do those founders need and those companies need? And that's where even as we think about our platform teams, it's not, you know, we haven't built an army. We're being very surgical about what are we hearing from our customers? What is most needle moving to them? And so it's defining back from that. And when I, we do that, I would just suggest that if you just apply a venture capital lens, then arguably you will operate the same type of firm that you would have 20 years ago. Yeah. But in an industry that is unrecognizable from 20 years ago. Right. Now, you can do that. I'm not suggesting you can't. But what we think about is the industry has shifted. Our customers have shifted. What is it that they want today? And how can we provide that? And then let's not label it like, yes, a part of that is venture capital, but why do we provide talent capability? You know, why do we use data and have a, why do we have a data science group at our firm? You know, why would we build a, an in-house corporate development group? Well, yeah. it's, it's because we've got to think about what's the right business to build in 2023 and looking forward to the next decade. But would you look at like rather than buyout you know, or? I guess you know it poses so many questions about if it's not just VC, what are the other things that you would seriously sort of consider? Yeah, it does, and I think the key is really to have a true north, right, and to you know anything that we do sort of be leveraging our capability and right. what we think we're good at. Okay, so you know it's interesting you ask about buyouts. Well, I think there's going to be a wave of venture recaps that are going to be coming. Right. Right. Those are companies we understand. Those are domains that we understand. Right. But there's going to be a slightly different kind of mindset, right, to the work that's going to need to be done there. Should we be thinking about that? I think we should. Right. But are we going to go and next year, are we going to start doing, you know, buyouts, control deals in IT services companies? No. There are people that, that do that far better than we ever will. It's not what we're good at. It's not who we are. But you are thinking about products around sort of the downturn of unicorns and what to, I mean, that's like convertible debt type deals or? Well, not necessarily. I mean, again, I think there are structured finance specialists that will do that better than we can. I mean, plain straight, you know, converts are fine. But, you know, as you get into more structured products, there are folks that it's a different skill set. You know, we'll still come at it from, Understanding the domain, understanding the trend lines at depth, the technical shifts, the founders, the people, the products. Mm. That's still going to be at the heart of any investing that we do, as opposed to, is this more of a, do you make your money because you figured out a structure that, you know, gives you a kicker in the event of X, right? Like, that's not what we're really good at. And so we'll leave that to the experts to do that. You sort of alluded, well, first of all, you're not going to, you're, you haven't announced something, so you're not telling me specifically what you're, you exactly you have in mind in terms of the new structure, right? I just want to make sure I'm not missing. Oh, no, I'm riffing with you. But do you yeah. have, is there a particular like fund or something that you're raising? No, you there's reference? nothing. I mean, we, our most yeah. recent set of funds are what they are, which is yeah. kind of early through, you know, through late stage. Yeah. No, I'm riffing with you about really under this sort of 
hey, I think we are a firm that looks to embrace where the opportunity is yeah. going. And so we think about that yeah. and we work back from our customers and the opportunity. But yeah, this, no, not, there's okay. nothing that there's we're not about There's not one to... that I have to like go figure out after this call. No, okay. no, no, it's no. It's more no. philosophical. Like we're open to, yeah. Yes. You've sort of talked about how large the retrenchment was after .com. That sort of framed the beginning of the conversation. You know, to put it another way, just interest rates have gone up significantly. You know, we were in a yeah. zero interest rate environment and now... We're not, and nobody knows for sure what that means for the venture capital asset class. Like I'm asking you to compare venture capital to private equity, but like nobody, private equity yeah. is not loved right now because of the interest rate problem. Yeah. So to put it directly to you, I mean, how do you think venture capital changes in this world of like, you know, higher interest rates and can it sustain if interest yeah. rates go up? So, so, you know, the reason I would, I'd separate this from, again, 2000 is that part of the challenge with the inventory of the set of companies that were built during that boom was a lot of them simply didn't work, right? So the retrenchment was that there was just a bunch of stuff that was upside down, okay? I, I think, you know, today there's certainly some of those, but the vast majority is there are real companies there. Arguably, they can't sustain the rates of growth they were operating at if they have to drive more free cash flow. And up the change in the interest rate environment will impact what those companies are worth, right? As opposed to, you know, just they're going to go away, right? Right. And so I think that the set of companies that obviously, you know, will have to go through those value adjustments, those valuation adjustments, that will happen, that has started to happen, more will happen through the rest of this year and likely 2024 as more of those companies come to market. As it relates to going forward... You know, the opportunity to buy 10 to 25% of companies that are potentially disruptive to very large markets and over time will build companies worth billions of dollars remains as true now as it did five years ago, right. as it did 10 years ago, and certainly more true than 20 years ago. More true, Right. And so then the question is really about, you know, entry discipline on the way in and doing the building and all the things that we have to do, you know, arguably you have, again, a more educated season, talent base, technology is a broader part of the economy. So I would say that we remain optimistic, you know, about the opportunities for venture capital. And it's sort of why I would say it's different than 2000. That is not to say that the adjustment will not be painful for the companies that, you know, that were funded in a different environment and in a sense tuned their businesses, right, far more tilted towards growth and the capital efficiency was not great as a result and that will need to happen and that will be a painful adjustment. Great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. Time flew. That's our episode. I'm Eric Newcomer. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you to Bajol Somaya from Lightspeed for coming on. Shout out to Tommy Heron, our audio editor, Riley Catella, my chief of staff, Annie Wen, our intern who's been booking a bunch of guests, helping with the podcast, and Young Chomsky for the wonderful theme music. Please like, comment, subscribe on YouTube, write us a review on Apple Podcasts, and of course, subscribe to the Substack, newcomer.co. See you next week. Goodbye, 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 goodbye.